And friends, at this time we are going to begin the funeral services for Robert Arthur Romanoff. We would encourage everyone to please find a seat at this time. If you have a cell phone or a pager, I would ask for you to take a moment to turn it off or make sure it's in the silent mode. And officiating today's services will be Rabbi Ari Margolis and Cantor Lori Akers from Congregation Or Shalom. And as we begin our service today, the, the rabbi will lead the family in the tradition of Kriya. Baruchim Habaim, welcome, as we are here on this day to honor and to remember, and even through our tears, to celebrate the life of Robert Arthur Romanoff, Bob, who taught me that the proper way to spell Bob backwards is B-O, uppercase B. <laughs> We're here because he has left such an incredible mark on all of our lives. And so as we're here today, I know in reflecting on these past few weeks and months that Bob's family has been through, I found these words from Francis and Kathleen Colo, who wrote, God saw you getting tired, and a cure was not to be. So God put God's arms around you and whispered, come to me. With tearful eyes, we watched you as you slowly slipped away. And though we loved you dearly, we couldn't make you stay. Your golden heart stopped beating. 
your tired hands put to rest. God broke our hearts because we know God has taken from us the best. And that's what we're here to do, to remember and to honor Bob, who was simply the best. A loving partner, a father who brought fun, a generous, kind-hearted grandfather, a professional who was well-respected by his peers, the straight and arrow rule follower who still managed to have that glint of mischief and humor in his eyes, that man with a golden heart, our Bob. And while he has been having a, he had a rough few months and we had to watch him fade from us, this is our time to begin to let go of how he left us and to re-embrace all the ways that he has filled us up over the years and all of the blessings that he has shared with us. I wish I had words that could just make it all seem right again, but it's not because he's not here sitting by our sides. It's gonna take time for that reality to become our new normal. And so we don't turn to the words that seek fixing in this time. We turn to words that express some of our hopes for his soul and for ours. And that's where we turn to the words of our tradition. We invite Cantor Lori Akers to come forward to share with us one of these psalms of our tradition. Shiviti Adonai Lenagditami Kimimini Baamot Lachin Samag Libi Vayagel of Basari Ishkon Lavetach Kilot Azov Nafshi Lishol Loti Tain Hasidha Lir Ochahat Todi Yorach Haim so vasem ahot et panecha neimot bimincha netzach. As Cantor Laurie just shared, We've set the eternal always before me, and God has been at our side. Therefore, our hearts exult and our souls rejoice for the goodness that we've had. Because of this, my being is secure. We pray, God, you will not abandon me in death, nor let your faithful one see destruction, but your, your presence brings us back to joy and helping us to find enduring happiness. Amen. These times we also turn to the words of Psalm 23, which you can find on the inside of your packet. Adonai ro'i lo'ech sar binot deshe yarbit seni. We read together. God is my shepherd, I shall not want. God maketh me to lie down in green pastures. God leadeth me beside the still waters. God restoreth my soul. God leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for God's name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, 
and I will dwell in the house of God forever. As we pray now that Bob's inheritance is this opportunity to dwell in this house of peace. This is our time now to lift up words of chesped, words that honor him and honor the legacy that he has created for each of us and the numerous blessings that he has shared. And so we invite first to come forward to share some words that remember him, his daughter, Laura. Together with Michelle, his other daughter. While my sister Michelle Levine is standing here with me, I have to give a disclaimer that Michelle takes after Bob and is all sweetness. So if this is salty, she is not to blame. (laughs) She hasn't even read this eulogy, so she may not endorse it. (laughs) My mom's cousin, Phil Sloan, whose son Andy is here, sent a lovely note this week. He hadn't seen our dad for years, but he described him exactly the way I want to remember him. Phil said, when I think about Bob, I picture him with a grin that he is trying to suppress as he gets ready to tell a funny anecdote or a good one-liner. He was a good guy. Here are some other things we'll remember about him. He loved the law and rules. He loved seatbelts and speed limits and safety. He was unpretentious. He spelled Bob the same backwards and forwards. He was Bob the pocket. He always wore his flak jacket, Mickey Mouse ties, Cubs bib, IHOP and Subway, and a twinkle in his eye. Our dad was quiet. Growing up, he seemed like Walter Mitty to me, but he had a quirky desire for the limelight. He always raised his hand at a magic show or blue man group or any opportunity for audience participation. He and his bestie, Jim Goldwasser, emceed the talent show at Michigania for years and years. And here's something perhaps surprising. He absolutely loved hypnosis. (laughs) I think he really loved being a lawyer and working for himself, although he was very proud of having been an assistant state's attorney. He did all kinds of criminal law, like burglary, robbery, homicide. I remember the first time he had a stalking case, and he felt very contemporary. Our phone would ring in the middle of the night, and he'd always take the call from Cook County Jail from people who needed a defense lawyer. But he really found his place in traffic court. He moved from LaSalle to Skokie to be right near the traffic court. He had a great community of people around him who appreciated his funny sense of humor and his Mickey Mouse ties and his expertise. My partner, Michael, met him later in life when his Parkinson's had weakened him and made my once six-foot dad, six-foot-tall dad so small. Every little task was such a chore, but Michael marveled at how he just kept going. He showed up even when it was really difficult and slow and probably really humbling. At his 59th anniversary with my mom, he gave a speech that took probably 30 minutes to get out, but he told it in his own time and in his own style. He just kept going. Bob tried to stay healthy other than perhaps vigorous exercise. He was a vaccine enthusiast. Literally on his deathbed, he asked the doctor for the RSV vaccine. (laughs) Twice. (laughs) He had self-improvement books and tapes and videos and CDs about finances, focus, relationships, and procrastination. The last one just didn't stick. He did EST. He wore those metal bracelets to ward off heavy metals. When Michelle was in eighth grade, she asked him to stop smoking for the Great American Smokeout, and he did. And he never smoked those little cigars my mom hated ever again. He weighed his food, he read labels, and he tried to eat the right thing. He maximized or maybe gamed the Weight Watchers point system, so he got so much food to eat, there weren't enough hours in the day to eat it all. (laughs) And he would not rest until he ate every last point. He had a wine glass, 
that he had drawn a line on with a Sharpie so he knew exactly how many ounces he was drinking. When I saw him drinking with a terrible grimace on his face, I asked him, why are you drinking? You hate wine. He answered, my doctor says it will relax me. <laughs> Bob was entirely uninterested in alcohol. He said he didn't like the taste and that his favorite beer was root. <laughs> the Bar Association, the Midwest Hypnosis Society, the Temple Brotherhood at Beth Emmett, the University of Michigan family camp where my parents made dear friends for life, film club, Hadassah, his brother Maya and sister-in-law Joyce, and the entire Maya Romanov corporations. Neighbors in Wilmette on our little street, neighbors at their condo building, and now friends at Brookdale. My parents have always nurtured community. In the last weeks of his life, he decided he wanted to join Michelle's family synagogue, Or Shalom. He wanted to be a part of that community led by the wonderfully kind Rabbi Ari. He loved being a Zaidi. When Michelle and Andy got married, they doubled the size of our family. We mushed our family into one with Andy's parents, Shirley and Phil, and adopted my honorary sister, Holly, Andy's brother, Frank, and their kids as dear grandchildren. But of course, at the end of the day, he was in a community of two with his steadfast companion, Hetty. They just celebrated their 60th anniversary. They invested in their marriage. They traveled together and took great trips all over the world. They gave tzedakah generously to Hadassah, Israel Bonds, Southern Poverty Law Center, alumni organizations, the Parkinson's Foundation, and probably a million other causes. They always looked out for each other. My mom was with him every day in these last few difficult months. Bob did everything right to give my mom and all of us security. He was responsible, even-tempered, kind, and showed up for everything always. All my life, I've had the comfort of knowing that my parents would happily sit and watch paint dry with me if I asked them. And they gave that feeling to my sister, and to their siblings, and to their grandchildren, and probably to all of you. We've gotten so many lovely messages from friends and family. They all talk about how kind and steady and generous Bob was. My, my wise cousin Ari said, I hope that your sorrow is leavened with sweet recollections of your father's goodness, fairness, mischievous sense of humor, and unmissable deep commitment to each of you. Growing up in Wilmette, I wished we were sportier or richer or waspier. I thought we were boring and just too regular. And it's only lately, with the help of my friends, that it has truly sunk in. I just had no idea how incredibly lucky we were to have stability and kindness and predictability and a mom and dad who never ever made us question if we're loved and safe and appreciated. I feel so lucky to say goodbye with no complicated feelings. We just love him and miss him and we're so very grateful that Robert Arthur Romanoff was our dad. Thank you, Laura, for this beautiful tribute to your father. And I think that many of us in this room can say we are just so grateful that Robert Romanoff was our fill in the blank. So we thank you for sharing. And now we're going to invite Joyce to come forward, Robert's sister-in-law. Laura, that was amazing and your heart and your soul was in there and you, you actually painted the picture of your dad so perfectly. William and Mildred's sons, the, the, the Romanoff boys, those wild and crazy guys. Robert and Richard, I married Maya, were about as different as day and night, 
both extraordinarily intelligent, Bob the pragmatist, and Maya the dreamer. But they fiercely loved and protected each other. When I first met Bob and Hetty over 30 years ago, Bob was our company attorney and supreme advisor. I was struck with their kindness and humor towards each other. I was blessed, I was blessed with the very best brother and sister-in-law and extended family. Bob and Maya were always in some kind of huddle, and often they came away laughing. Not that running our business was fun and games, but they tried to keep things in perspective. Bob always stuck to his beliefs and honesty with honesty, integrity, and love of family. His daughters, Michelle and Laura, and his beloved grandchildren, Kaylee and Ben, were the top priority, and of course, Hetty. To illustrate the brothers' closeness, when Maya and I were saying our vows when we finally got married, um, almost, almost 30 years ago, the rabbi said, do you take this woman to be your wife, etc." And Maya said, I have to ask my brother. <laughs> hmm. now, now you understand love and humor. I will miss you, Bob. And I am very grateful to have you in my life. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce, for your words and for helping us all to really understand that deep connection that Bob had with his brother. And now we're going to invite to come forward Kaylee and Aaron, Bob's granddaughters. Many, many. 
memories left still to bloom. Oh, me, oh, my Zadie. I miss you so much already. Thank you, Kaylee and Aaron. Just an incredibly heart-filled tribute to a person who's meant so much to you. And as much as he meant to you, I'm sorry, I know it's not a competition, but you meant so much more to him. His love was truly unending, and that's why I have this poem here from Rabbi Rami Shapiro, who wrote, we are loved by an unending love. We are embraced by arms that find us even when we are hidden from ourselves. We are touched by fingers that soothe us even when we are too proud for soothing. We are counseled by voices that guide us even when we are too embittered to hear. We are loved by an unending love. We are supported by hands that uplift us, even in the midst of a fall. We are urged on by eyes that meet us, even when we are too weak for meeting. We are loved by an unending love. Embraced, touched, soothed, and counseled, ours are the arms, the fingers, the voices. Ours are the hands, the eyes, the smiles. We are loved by an unending love love. And that's how Bob always made us feel. His large heart and deep love has been unending, and it is still here with us. That's why we, in our tradition, say, may his memory be a blessing, because when we remember him, even though right now there is pain, there is also love. He is always that stalwart person in our lives, that trustworthy and reliable man that we knew that he would share what he was thinking with us. Going way back into his earliest days, he was always the reliable one. When his brother Maya had gone off to Europe and his parents wanted to get him back, they sent Bob. <laughs> Even though he grew up in the, the time of the 60s, as you reflected, Laura and Michelle, don't think anything illicit ever touched him. Uh, even when he was asked about chemical exposure, he said the only thing he could think of was uh, there were some chemicals at his brother's company that he might have stood near at some point. He was always a person who followed the rules whatever those rules were. But Hetty, he, he met you at just the right moment as you were both at a Hillel mixer at Michigan. Frances Parker was holding court with all the gentlemen. There was a line to get to see her. And you were standing kind of next to that line. And Bob was in that line but decided that that line wasn't worth waiting for. He turned to you and you started talking. And that's how you met. It took about four to five years before we really knew that this was the relationship that it meant to be. You weren't serious for a very long time, but you kept on falling back into one another's orbit. He was in law school at Northwestern, and you eventually got married with, when he had a, a year left of school. You got married at the Standard Club, and he stuck with you despite the fact that you dropped a strawberry right down the front of your wedding gown. <laughs> That's how you knew that these 60 years of life and love 
of family and of memories was meant to be. And he certainly had you at his center at all times, Eddie. He had a very storied career. After graduating from law school, he had worked with Maya as his legal consultant and also started his own practice eventually. He did pro bono criminal defense work through the Bar Association and was very active in that organization, so much so that the North Shore Bar Association wanted to honor him for all of his life's dedication. He was active in Midwest hypnosis, hypnosis in the law. He had an award in his office for dealing with the organization. Laura, you said he could be a bit of a quirky dude. He wore bow ties regardless of what others said or did. That is, until you and Michelle, with your mom's blessing, permission, blessing, <laughs> encouragement, went into his closet and took all of his bow ties away. That's how the Mickey Mouse tie era began. And I can see many of you honored that uh, tradition. I didn't have any Mickey Mouse ties, so I brought this uh, Bugs Bunny tie in my pocket in his memory for all of you. But he had this wonderful career that he did his way. But more important than practicing the law, if you can imagine such a thing for Bob, was getting to spend time with his family and be with all of you. Hetty, you loved to eat with him. <laughs> Whatever you could do, and you loved to travel together. You loved your summers at Camp Michigania, where Bob could be a bit of adventurous. Many summers you took sailing lessons together, and many summers you had to be towed back to shore. <laughs> but he would try everything, including zip lining and the leap of faith at the top of Camp Michigania's ropes courses. He would face his fears and be up to whatever, whatever was out there to try. He loved to travel. He went to some incredible trips together with you, Hetty, to Australia and New Zealand, to Eastern Europe, to China. He really wanted to make sure that he took, out, took in every moment of life that was given to him. And he had a great humor about him, whether it was those witty one-liners Sometimes not so witty. But it didn't matter what was going on. He knew what was important, what was grounded, and he could see the humor in any moment. In fact, uh, you, Frank was recalling a Thanksgiving when Holly had this whipped cream uh, distributor that wasn't very easy to use. And when Ben was attempting to put whipped cream on his dessert, it shot out sideways and hit Bob. Then Eddie tried to do it, and the same thing, right there on Bob, on his bib. But he wasn't angry about it. He saw the humor in it right away and turned in what could have been a, a terrible memory into a loving and wonderful memory. But Kaylee and Ben, Aaron, you guys all, Eddie, you guys all were what gave him the chance to have his most important role in life. You brought him to uh, embrace the role of Zadie. And that was his favorite title. Kaylee, you came home from JCC day camp and looked at him at age two and you, called, you wanted to call him Zadie. And from that day, he was hooked. He loved it, Eddie, when you asked him, can I call you Zadie too? And that is a result of that question, this incredible family unit that has been through thick and thin, but always together, has been formed. Bob had a perseverance about him that inspired many of us you know, because his, of his Parkinson's, he had to slow down. But it didn't stop him from doing things. Even going to Costco, it might take three hours to go through Costco 
We might have had to change the battery out on the rascal that Hetty was on. But he didn't let it stop him from doing what he was determined to do. As you heard, Bob is a rule follower, so much so that he almost got kicked off of a cruise during the H1N1 time. He got on, and of course, he was completely honest because he was being Bob. When they asked him if he was sick, he said, well, I have a little cough. He eventually made it onto that cruise. But he filled all of your lives with so many incredible memories and love. And when I asked you what you've learned from him, Michelle, you said that he was just so even keel. It always took so much to really get him upset. Well, aside from Hetty. <laughs> that you always knew that it was going to be okay when you were around him. Kaylee, you said you learned from him to, to fight for what you believe in and never give up, because that's what he did as a lawyer. Aaron, you said that you learned that there's always a solution, there's always a path to figuring things out. You can make it work even if it takes time. Laura, you said that you had learned from him the value of having long-standing relationships, of being able to collect people wherever you go and see that you are strengthened because of those relationships. Now, Holly, you said that you have always appreciated that if you ever had a legal whatever, you could call Bob. He'd know either what to do or who he could call to help out. And so we are here. We're here now to take all of these memories and to carry them forward, to take all of the lessons that he has shared with us and to live them. And in that way, not only will we make his memory a blessing for us, but when we live in the examples that Bob has taught us, we will make his memory a blessing through us for the world and will continue uh, pushing forward his legacy on this earth. And so it is our time now to take him with us and remember him. To remember him when we see a Purim celebration and someone is playing the part of Vashti. We will remember him when we see a bow tie or a Mickey Mouse tie or an IHOP or a subway. We'll remember him every time we try to spell Bob or any time we think of a double feature or a pinball arcade. And we'll remember him every time we need to hear one of his jokes or some of his sage advice, because we'll be able to hear him, because he's now here, as he's always been. And so I share you with this last poem. They never quite leave us, our loved ones who've passed, through the shadows of death to the sunlight above, a thousand sweet memories are holding them fast to the places they blessed with their presence and love. The work which they left and the books which they read speak mutely, though still with an eloquence rare. And the songs that they sung and the dear words that they said, they linger and sigh on the desolate air. And oft when alone and oft in the throng, or when evil allures us or sin draws near, a whisper comes gently, don't do the wrong. And we feel their strength in us with nothing to fear. May Bob's whisper always be in your head. May his love always be in the forefront of your heart. And may his memory always bring you the joy that he has brought you for so many years. May this be his blessing, may this be your blessing, and may this be all of our blessing. And let us say, Amen. 
And we now turn to the words of our El Male Rachamim prayer, the prayer in which we offer our hope for his soul, that it be protected now under the shadow of God's wings. We invite you to please rise as able. together on the inside of our packets, El Malay Rachamim, O God, full of compassion, thou who dwellest on high, grant perfect rest beneath the sheltering wings of thy presence, among the holy and pure who shine as the brightness of the firmament, unto the soul of Robert Arthur Romanoff, who has gone unto eternity. Lord of mercy, bring him under the cover of thy wings, and let his soul be bound up in the bond of eternal life. Be God's possession, and may his repose be peace. Amen. Please be seated. And as we prepare to honor Bob's legacy in so many ways, I just want to point out one more thing. Bob was the epitome of the diehard Cubs fan, because when we had the opportunity to gather together and say prayers for the end of life together with him, and I asked him after saying these blessings with your whole family, his whole family surrounding him, if he had any questions, he asked, Cubs score? <laughs> and so we know that his, you were his love, his Cubs were his love but his love was always on the forefront of his mind. May we all be surrounded by his love. Friends, this concludes our services here at the chapel. The interment and burial service will continue at Memorial Park in Skokie. For those of you traveling with us to the cemetery and the funeral procession, please do keep the following safety precautions in mind. Please make sure that your bright headlights and your four-way hazard flashers are on. Please be sure to obtain an orange funeral safety sticker for your windshield, and we will be providing several of the cars in the procession with a magnetic orange flag to be placed on top of your car. Please travel as close as safety permits to the car in front of you to avoid any gaps in the procession. And for your own safety and security, I would suggest not speaking or texting while driving to the cemetery in the funeral procession. Following the interment, the family will be together for Shiva at the Joyce Romanoff residence at 926 Waterford Lane in Northbrook. They'll be together as they return from the cemetery until 8 p.m. 
and then continuing Shiva on Thursday at Brookdale at 4501 Concord Lane in Northbrook from 6 until 8 p.m. That information, as well as information regarding memorial contributions of the Parkinson's Foundation, Hadassah, or Congregation, or Shalom, that information is available in the service folder that you should have received. If not, we do have those for you as you leave. And for those of you joining us online, that information is also available on our website. At this time, I would ask the pallbearers to come forward, Kaylee, Ben, Aaron, and Eddie Levine, Andy and Frank Levine, and Michael Wilson. And I'll ask everyone to please rise and stand in place as we escort the casket, the family, and the clergy from the chapel. <laughs> 